Hello, this is Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now, they are turbulent times in Europe at the moment. And our guest for this part of the programme is a man who has seen a few turbulent years of his own in his home country. He is a former Prime Minister of Italy, now both head of the Jacques Delors Institute, president in fact, and also dean of the Paris School of International Affairs. Enrico Letta, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Now, um, I mentioned those turbulent times. I'm mainly referring to Brexit. At the time of recording, uh, there are still many ongoing uh, developments with the Brexit story. Uh, but I believe we can still talk about it quite safely. Um, the UK leaving without a deal at this point is still a possibility, what with all the comings and goings we've seen over the last days. How likely do you think we are now to have a no-deal Brexit? I think we are very close to a no-deal Brexit because of the, uh, you know, the parliament, the, the UK parliament has just two potential majorities in favour of one deal. Uh, one majority is the uh, government majority today, but it's clear that Boris Johnson doesn't want uh, to support any Theresa May uh, proposal, so it's gone. And the other potential majority is a sort of bipartisan majority, so Conservatives and Labour, or part of a Labour. But the feeling is that uh, Jeremy Corbyn wants new elections and wants the power there. So, frankly speaking, I don't see how a deal, any deal, can have the majority in the Parliament. There are a lot of people in the UK, increasingly so, I think, who advocate a no-deal Brexit, saying that perhaps, in fact, it's better than the UK getting tied into a deal that a lot of people are unhappy with and having stipulations that you've then signed up to. Uh, they think of a no-deal Brexit as a clean break. Could you see merit in that approach? I think it's the continuation of, a, uh, I would say, a nightmare, the ambiguous nightmare of this referendum. Because at the end of the day, a no deal has a lot of concrete and negative consequences in terms of uh, lack of rules, in terms of stop to the investments, in terms of uh, how to stop investments from abroad, because I think from, from China, from Brazil, from India, can you imagine people putting money in Europe, into Europe or into uh, the UK in this chaotic period. I think that will have a very, very bad influence. So um, I think the no deal, it's clearly a chaotic situation for a long period. A chaotic situation means uh, bad consequences for both mm -hmm. the UK economy, but also the, the uh, European Union economy. And when I see, for instance, my country, my own country, Italy, in these very turbulent times, Italy doesn't need instability, financial markets, instability, and a turbulent Brexit or a no-deal Brexit risks to push for instability and consequences there. Well, as you said, uh, you yourself have left politics, but your country's current government very much uh, in a clash with the European Commission currently. This is all about the budget. Just to recap for our viewers, uh, the Commission believes that the debt and deficit levels that the Italian government wants to run to uh, are just simply far too high. Now, the plans, though, do keep debt and deficit within the Commission's uh, limits, broadly speaking. Uh, should the Commission just be leaving Italy's government to get on with it? My feeling is that it's very important to avoid a systemic crisis. It's very important that, and I hope, the government and the European Commission can negotiate. I saw uh, Moscovici and Juncker trying to have a negotiations. I saw the Italian Minister for uh, Finance, Mr. Tria, trying to have negotiations. Uh, the worst case uh, scenario for what I think is a backlash, crisis, new elections in Italy uh, early next year. This scenario that is not impossible is the worst scenario. I hope... Why would it be so bad to have new elections? Uh, because new elections will bring, I think, in this situation, uh, uh, a political cleavage mm -hmm. in the electoral campaign, mm -hmm. Europe or non-Europe. And I think we have to avoid uh, uh, an electoral campaign based on this kind of uh, scenario. And because... The, the old forecasts are saying that Mr. Salvini uh, could win the elections. And I don't like Mr. Salvini's positions. I hope uh, the Italian uh, political landscape can change 
uh, but not in that, sit that situation. And I'm sure that uh, a big country like Italy can bring big instability uh, at the European level. So this is why I hope uh, mm -hmm. the European Commission can have, can have a more soft approach, negotiating, avoiding a big crisis. I know it's difficult. I know it's very difficult <laughs> because there's a sort of provocation from Rome. But it's better to have a negotiating approach rather than a crisis today. And in terms of actually the, the economy itself, Italy is, relatively speaking, a very rich country in this world. But there are a lot of people who are suffering. Uh, and we've even seen how the infrastructure is suffering, that absolutely catastrophic bridge collapse in Genoa. Um, the Italian economy could certainly do with a boost, couldn't it? How, how would you advocate doing that? I think the big luck uh, for, for, the, for the Italian economy is for investments. We and it is one of the outcomes of the crisis. So borrowing big, as the current government is advocating, they say they want to invest to yes, boost growth. Yes, but to have investments, not to have, for instance, money just to uh, change the rules for having an early retirement. That is against any rule of common sense. Mm -hmm. So it's not how much money is being no, borrowed it's, and spent, it's, it's, it's where it's Where it's, it's pushing growth. Mm. Italy needs... Uh, policies for, for, for the south of Italy, because we, mm. after some years, we have a new uh, big cleavage between north and south in terms of lack of uh, investments in the south. And the south of Italy is 30% of the country. We can't leave the south like that in a corner. It's, it's a pity. Well, I suppose the, the, the Five Star Movement, particularly, a lot of their supporters do come from the south, and, and they would perhaps argue that uh, the Partito Democratico that you were prime minister for and, and the previous prime ministers and governments uh, were the ones who brought about um, this situation through austerity, responding to the euro crisis and so on. I think there's a big problem, a big responsibility is in the hands of uh, those like me, but also that, like others governing before. Mm. I assume these responsibilities because I know that the first response of the European Union was not enough, but not enough uh, long-term vision. Mm -hmm. uh, too many austerity measures at the very beginning, mm. 11, 12. Panic almost. And some panic. So we had some flexibility in the years after my government. Mm. I think we didn't use this flexibility uh, for, for the right, uh, uh, we say, uh, targets. Mm -hmm. And today we are paying this price. Well, let's uh, just stick with Italy for a couple more minutes. So we've got our regular fact-checking segment, uh, Fact or Fake, and the story this week is from Italy. Today on Fact or Fake, a claim made by the Italian Interior Minister Matteo Salvini. At the end of September, he asserted that charity rescue ships were bringing to Italian shores, quote, hundreds of thousands of immigrants each day. This in an interview to the politically hard right French magazine Valeurs Actuelles. Well, we've checked and the numbers are vastly exaggerated. Firstly, the total number of migrant rescues into Italy in the last four years is 611,414. Just over half of those rescues were carried out by the Italian Coast Guard and Navy, 181,000 by European missions and commercial ships. And finally, charities were behind just a fraction, 120,000 over four years. Well, we conclude that not only did Mr Salvini get his numbers drastically wrong, he also misattributed responsibility to the group that carried out the smallest number of rescues. Enrico, let's to get some comment from you on that story. Uh, the number of people arriving in Europe overall is drastically down. Why do you think Matteo Salvini is continuing such harsh rhetoric on migrants? But because he knows very well that is the only way uh, for him gaining uh, a consensus, raising votes, uh, raising fears. Having he wrong numbers is the way to raise fears. And he has caused some reaction in Europe, though, at that June summit. Uh Yes, but you know, what is really incredible is the fact that his leader, raising fears because of his populist party, at the same time, his interior minister and the Home Affairs Minister usually is there to find solutions, mm -hmm. not to get the problem open. And the problem open for him is the only way to have votes. This is why I think his attitude is the attitude not to 
calm down the situation and to find solutions. But it's, it's to put fire and to have not solutions, but to have more problems. This is why I'm so anti-Salvini in these uh, 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 proposals, but also in, in this attitude. And you know, the big problem of Italy, not only Italy, is the gap between perception and reality. Do you know how many uh, immigrants the Italians think are in the country? 22% of the population, according to the, the most important uh, uh, opinion polls, the reality is 8%. So you have a gap an enormous gap there, and this gap is part of the problem because it's very difficult to deal with a concrete problem mm. having this incredible gap. All right, let's move on uh, from internal European affairs. I'd like to look at uh, outside of Europe's border. As we said, you're Dean of the School of International Affairs uh, in Paris. Um, there are several countries waiting in the wings right now, trying to become EU members, obviously not put off by what we see as chaos, perhaps, sometimes. Uh, the Balkan states of Albania, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Turkey, all candidate countries currently. Uh, with the issues that the EU is having with its existing members, is it a good time to be thinking about enlargement? I strongly believe it's a great topic. And is uh, we put this topic in a corner is a big mistake mm. because the instability in the Balkans will bring instability in the rest of Europe. I think Serbia is quite ready to be uh, in. And I think to give the... A roadmap for Albania, for Macedonia, mm -hmm. is so important for stability of this part of the world. And this part of the world is important for Europe. Well, it's not just uh, the EU looking at what's going on in the Balkans. Uh, I'd actually like to run a report now by uh, France 24's team. And they've been to see how there's a major and growing Saudi Arabian presence uh, in another Balkan state, Bosnia, not yet a candidate country. Uh, this is from Karim Yayoi and Mohamed Farhad. In the heart of Sarajevo, the SCC shopping centre is a prime example of Saudi investment in Bosnia. One of the great things about it is that every single penny that was spent for the construction was spent in Bosnia, which means Bosnian materials, Bosnian workers, Bosnian companies, everything. So this uh, building had a huge impact on Bosnian economy. The projects came with a number of requests from the Saudi investors, who demanded a total ban on alcohol sales inside the shopping center. But it isn't just Bosnia's economy that has caught the Saudis' interest. King Fad is the largest mosque in the Balkans. The cultural center just next to it provides free courses to students. On paper, religion isn't taught in the cultural center. Professor Mehovic insists that it is separate from the Salafis that set up shop outside the mosque. After a half-hour discussion, one of the vendors agreed to speak to us. This mosque was built shortly after the war, and it was welcomed by Muslims. It was funded by Muslims, by trustworthy people, from Saudi Arabia to the Bosnian people. The Saudi government provided support during and after Bosnia's ethnic conflict in the 1990s. Several thousands of Islamists joined the war to fight as Mujahideen. While most of them left when the conflict ended, a number stayed behind and began preaching a more radical interpretation of the Quran. We're on our way to Igman, a mountain located one hour away from Sarajevo, to speak to Haran Hojic. A former commander in the armed forces, he is now an imam. We meet him outside a mosque that features typical Bosnian architecture. Saudi Arabia funded the reconstruction of places of worship, but at the end of the day, only a very small number of people here share their vision of Islam. I'm sure it's less than 2% of Bosnians. The other 98% follow Abu Hanifia and the Bosnian Islamic community. We didn't abandon our principles and we are not going to. It could have happened during the war, but it didn't. So there we go, Saudi Arabia, the EU, uh, there's also Russian influence in the Balkans as well. Is this a, a sort of a fight for dominance or is that going too far? I think it's a, it's a battle of influence and it's clearly a a very important challenge for all of us. The European Union needs to be in the Balkans, the leading uh, power, the leading Why? soft power. Good Balkans are there. 
They are not close to Arabia. They are not close to Russia. It's they just across the water us. from Italy, of course. Yes. So mm. uh, we had always bad news in our history from the uh, Balkans instability. We are now just uh, at the end of celebrations of the end of World War I. Everything started there in Sarajevo. So I think we have to learn lessons from history. And uh, the EU has been accused in the past, perhaps with uh, some states uh, such as Hungary and Poland that are clashing with the, the, the Commission at the moment, um, of perhaps not paying enough attention to the history, the culture, the, the atmosphere in those countries as they were perhaps for some rushed into joining the EU. Uh, do you think the lessons have been learned there? I think we have to take care of, of, of this situation, of uh, lessons of the history, we have to know that these countries are not like uh, us, are not like France or Italy. Uh, these countries, they have a different history. Even Poland and Hungary, they had 40 years of uh, very different history. Precisely. So we have to respect this mm. history, and we have to integrate, and we didn't have... Uh, I think we had a very a, a wrong attitude almost a colonial attitude, cultural colonial attitude, by saying that now you enter the European Union and we are the European Union. In reality, uh, together we build a new European Union. This is, I think, the right approach. And with this approach, we can ask them uh, to be compliant with, with rules and apply rules like we do. Enrico Letta, thank you very much for being our guest this week on Talking Europe. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you soon for more European news on France 24. Every year during Ashura, Shiite Muslims mourn the death of Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. In Lebanon, it's also a time for Hezbollah supporters to proclaim their loyalty to their leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Sought by both Israel and the Islamic State organization, he addresses his followers from a secret location. In this report from the heart of Hezbollah, reporters Maisa Awad and Romeo Langlois bring us exclusive footage of a religious ceremony with military overtones. And this year, the Hezbollah leader makes a staggering announcement. Our special correspondents are the real eyewitnesses of the news. Join me for reporters. 